Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this uh, pre joint presentation with uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise and Windrower. Just by way of background, uh, we're going to talk about a specific component of Helium carrier grade, uh, which is based on OpenStack uh, with carrier grade features and uses some technologies from Windrower as well. Okay, my name is Madhu Kashyap. I'm uh, I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise in the NFV business unit. I'm responsible for all of the open source uh, strategy and direction, including OpenStack, OpenDaylight, and OPNFV. And with me is Glenn Seiler from Wind River. And Good afternoon. Okay, so Glenn, you want to take I'll it I'll kick away? it off. How about I take it off? All right. So good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to talk to you this morning about some interesting uh, benchmarks, performance benchmarks that uh, Wind River and Hewlett Packard Enterprise uh, have run together with uh, Spirant. And uh, we want to kind of map how these benchmarks um, map to solving industry business problems, if I can just solve how to move this pointer here. Yeah. All right. So what we want to do, first of all, is look at just very quickly some of the software components. As Madhu had mentioned, uh, we're going to be talking about Helion carrier grade, uh, HPE Helion carrier grade. Some of the technologies in the uh, Helion carrier grade uh, were uh, designed by Wind River, and we have a, a partner relationship between Wind River and, and HPE. We want to identify some of the performance bottlenecks that we see common bottlenecks in the industry and provide some details on how we've done these characterization test cases. And then, of course, present the results. The focus is going to be around data plane performance, the vSwitch, the packet processing engine, and it's going to pinpoint areas that, uh, that, we're, that we have compared to standard open source components. Um, and you'll see some pretty dramatic, uh, we think some pretty dramatic um, performance in, in improvements. But one of the things that, that I, a couple of things I want to emphasize. First of all, this is done by a third party testing lab. Uh, we used Spirant to, uh, to actually do the testing, run the tests, uh, provide the, uh, the packet throughput engine. And we also used an independent analyst, uh, Tully, to, uh, to actually verify the results. And we'll have a published report on this uh, later, coming out in the next week or two. So like I said, one of the things I want to do, rather than just talking about benchmarks and performance and you know, my dog's faster than your dog or you know, my server's faster than yours, I want to tie it back to why performance actually solves a business problem. So, there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons why service providers, equipment manufacturers are looking to NFV to, to solve certain problems. And I, I like to characterize it into three sort of categories. First of all is increasing top line revenue, getting new revenues. And, and that's you know, gaining market share by providing uh, new services very quickly. So that's top line revenue. And then there's really lowering costs, whether you're lowering CapEx or whether you're lowering, lowering OpEx. And that can be done through a, a number of ways. Uh, obviously, one of the main principles of NFV is using COTS-based hardware, or what I like to call industry standard high volume hardware, uh, but also using common de facto open source components. And that's lowering costs. And where Increasing revenue and lowering costs kind of meet in the middle is agility. And, and that agility and the ability to roll out services quickly is really, uh, I think, the intersection uh, and one of the main benefits of NFV that service providers are, are looking to, to, to benefit from. But we're, what we're going to talk about, I want to be very clear, what we're going to talk about here is really number three, cost optimizations. We're going to talk about how you lower OPEX by increasing VM density by, by having very, very fast packet throughput. So I want to tie it from just running benchmarks all the way back up to what's the real business problem, why this even matters. 
So first of all, just a little bit about the architecture so you understand the tests that we've been running. This is the, uh, the HP Helion carrier grade uh, architecture. Um, what we're really going to be focusing on is the middle node there, which is the compute node. That's the data plane node. So that's you know, running standard Linux and uh, a very high performant uh, KVM using some of the real time patches that are available in the community. And then the, uh, the Wind River accelerated vSwitch, which uses Intel DPDK. Uh, some of the other things that we've done is we've added an accelerated virtual port, which is essentially a kernel loadable module that sits in the guest OS of the virtual machine and provides very, very fast packet throughput between the vSwitch running in uh, user space and the application up in the virtual machine. And they talk directly. The, uh, the accelerated virtual port essentially emulates a, uh, an, an Intel Niantic uh, type of uh, Ethernet port. And as I said, provides very, very fast throughput. So we're going to be focusing really on the performance of the compute node uh, with data traffic going in and up to the virtual machine. Uh, the overall system itself, as you can see, uses OpenStack for the control plane as our framework for the control plane. Uh, the vSwitch has a, a Neutron plug-in that, that talks back to OpenStack and, and can perform various functions, live migration, and things of that nature. But what we're really going to focus on here is the performance from the physical devices up through the vSwitch and into the virtual machine. So just a little bit more about service provider OPEX and CAPEX. This chart that I'm showing here uh, is from CIMI. If you're not familiar with that, some of you might be familiar with an, uh, an industry pundit analyst named uh, um, Tom mm -hmm. Knoll. Uh, he has, provides a, almost a daily blog on, on NFV and, and telecom. And he, he created this chart, which is actually a little bit uh, um, unnerving if you think about it because it essentially shows that you know towards the end of this year next year the cost uh, the revenue if you will per bit will start to exceed the uh, or or the cost per bit sorry will become more than the revenue per bit which essentially means that CSPs and telcos are losing money uh, now obviously we can't let that happen that's one of the reasons why uh, NFV is, is so important today, NFV and SDN. We know why it's happening, because of the exploding video uh, growth in video. But what's really critical to this is, there's only two ways to fix that, by the way, right? Increase the revenue per bit or decrease the costs per bit. It's only two ways to really solve it. So critical to solving that problem is increasing capacity and lowering the costs per subscriber. And that's really what we're doing by showing and driving this increased vSwitch performance is we're actually going to show how that lowers the cost per subscriber. So let's take a look at, at kind of what we're doing. This is the diagram that I showed from the previous slide kind of focuses in on the vSwitch architecture. You can see the virtual machine traffic going from the VM to the vSwitch, and then from the vSwitch out to the network. Uh, so this is the vSwitch that's used in the Helion uh, carrier grade product. And what we've seen is orders of magnitude. So depending, of course, on the use case, depending on um, whether or not they're using uh, the uh, the accelerated virtual port, the kernel loadable module that I mentioned, we've seen anywhere from 10 to 40 times better performance than just sort of the standard OVS that's in the open source community today. So what we're going to be showing is the increased switching performance equals greater VM density. And the reason that's important is because the payload, the service, that you're running is, is running in a virtual machine and you want more cores available to run that service, fewer cores running the vSwitch. Nobody's making money by selling vSwitches, right? People are making money by running services 
on top of, uh, on top of the servers with as many cores and, and consolidating as much as possible. So the more cores that are available for the VMs or the services to run, uh, the, more, uh, the more subscribers than you can get per server. That's going to result in significantly lower OPEX. Now, it, re it results in lower CAPEX as well, but really, over the long term, the lower, cap the lower OPEX of, of supporting and maintaining and managing fewer servers will, uh, will significantly you know, uh, result in more savings than just the CAPEX. So let's look at a specific use case. This is a real use case that, that we've tested, and it's a, a virtualized uh, media gateway. So obviously it's running a lot of data, right? Very, uh, very high data content. And the bandwidth required for an instance of this particular application is about three and a half gigabits uh, per core. The system configuration that we tested was a standard two-socket uh, two Xeon server, uh, 14 cores per processor per socket, so 28 cores total. And you know, our testing, what we were able to do with just standard open source or op standard vSwitch was really the most efficient implementation required about 23 cores to get that much bandwidth through the system. That really only left one core or one, one core, one VM to run the payload. So you're essentially running one instance of the payload per server. That's not very efficient. Now, on the other hand, when we used the AVS or accelerated virtual switch, we were able to run that same amount of traffic in 10 cores rather than in, in, uh, in 23 cores. That left 17 cores for running the actual payload, which is where you're going to drive subscriber, uh, you know, subscriber uh, data. So that results in about a 17 to 1 difference in capacity. That's significantly greater VM density, ver and, and which results in significantly reduced OPEX, more subscribers per server. So that's really why running and testing and validating these benchmarks in this packet performance is so critical. Now I'll talk just a little bit about the tests, then I'll hand it over to Madhu to actually run through the actual tests. Um, as I've said, performance is really the key enabler to be able to deploy really large scale NFV deployments. And the way that you can measure that and get a sense for how a system is going to operate in these large-scale deployments is by running the benchmarks. But it's very important to be able to run industry standard, industry standard accepted benchmarks. So one of the things we'll show you is that the benchmarks we're running here are defined by the Etsy organization. Uh, they are, uh, have been run and validated by independent third party. And uh, we're working, both Wind River and HPE, with organizations such as Etsy and OPNFV to further define these tests and make them available so that anyone can, can uh, run the same tests. And that way, as suppliers and as, as, uh, as service providers start to look for solutions, there'll be a common industry standard way to benchmark and identify performance. So hopefully that gave you some ideas of why this is important, how it ties back to ultimately uh, lowering OPEX for the service providers. I'm going to hand it over to Madhu now, and he's going to actually run through the tests and the results. Thank you, Glenn. All right, so let's get to the, the guts of uh, some of this presentation and, uh, and the results and the tests uh, that we ran. So just to give you an overview, um, like Glenn mentioned, we. Uh, base the tests on uh, the Etsy test specs. Uh, this uh, particular test was run only for layer two switches, the, the V switch, and we use different uh, frame sizes uh, for the different tests. And this is hot off the press. This was uh, literally done last week. Um, we did phase one of the tests, which are the, the benchmarking tests that I'll walk you through. Uh, unfortunately, we, the phase two, which was the 
availability resiliency tests uh, had to be postponed because of the, the floods uh, in our Houston lab uh, and um, messed up the, the testing there. Uh, but we did run uh, the phase one of the test, uh, which is the results that you'll see here. Okay. Sorry. I'm not able to. Okay. Um, so these are the four tests that we ran. So the, the first one is a actual packet forwarding test, the benchmark test. The next one is a consistency test where you run multiple um, uh, runs of the, the same test, uh, 10 trial runs to see if you get the same consistent performance from the network and from the vSwitch. Uh, the third one is the latency distribution. Again, you, uh, we measure uh, min, max, and average latency of the packets going through the, the network. And finally is the uh, scale testing for the number of flows on the, on the vSwitch. So we test for uh, different scale numbers. And uh, that is the, uh, the fourth and final one. So let's get into each of the tests. Uh, before that, um, just a quick um, uh, note on the hardware that was used for the test. So we used both the, uh, the ProLine DL360 Gen 9, which is the rack mount server, and we tested also on the Blade server, uh, BL460 Gen 9, uh, Generation 9. Uh, it's a dual CPUs, uh, eight cores uh, per socket, and uh, the network card, uh, which is HP branded as the Intel Niantic uh, uh, NIC. Okay, so this is uh, the first test here, um, the uh, forwarding, um, packet forwarding benchmark test. So we used uh, three topologies. Uh, first one is the, from left to right, uh, physical to physical. Basically, uh, the idea is to just run uh, the accelerated vSwitch on a bare metal server and run the packet through, uh, run the packets through the vSwitch and back out again. And so this simulates uh, where you might have uh, services running on bare metal uh, and uh, the accelerated vSwitch running there. And uh, pack this is running DPDK, uh, the vSwitch, and uh, the packets actually go into user space and, and back out again. Uh, the second uh, test uh, is a single VM test, uh, so again, uh, packet going through the guest VM and back out again. And finally, um, you can think of the, the last test sort of as a service function chaining uh, test where you have two VMs uh, and packets traversing both the VMs and out again. Okay. And we use the Spirant uh, generator, packet generator uh, test here uh, to, to generate the, the, the traffic. Okay. All right, so on the the, the, the last test, the, the VM to VM, this was uh, where you have uh, basically three networks here. Uh, one uh, going into uh, the, the first VM and then uh, VM to VM and then back out again. So we are talking about um, six ports. So the ingress, egress ports of the, the accelerated vSwitch going into the VM and then back out from the, the second VM. So in all we are seeing about 32, uh, 39 uh, gigabits per second traffic going through the system uh, with absolutely no data loss that uh, we can tell from, uh, from the test that we ran. Okay. This is running uh, nearly at, uh, at line speed, 99% of uh, line speed, uh, line rate. So let me walk you through some of the, the numbers uh, as well here. So these are the tests for the different frame sizes. What you see on the x-axis is the, uh, the, the frame sizes. Uh, on the, the y-axis is the uh, line rate percentage. Uh, so as you see from um, you know, smaller frame, frame sizes to the, the largest, uh, for all of the three different topologies, whether it's a physical to physical, single VM, uh, VM to VM. Um, so for the smallest uh, frame sizes, you have uh, quite a bit of overhead. And so you would, uh, you know, for uh, encapsulating, decapsulating, and, and all of the overhead there, uh, you will see the line rate uh, for uh, virtual machine to virtual machine running at about 18% of line rate, okay? And going up to just physical, bare metal, just the vSwitch install, about roughly in the um, upper, uh, lower 60, 60%, right? 
And as you go across uh, the x-axis and as the, the frame sizes increase, uh, increasingly you'll see that you know, past you know, 256 bytes there uh, for single VM and uh, VM to VM, um, sorry, physical and uh, single VM, you, you start hitting the line rate uh, percentage. So it's running at 100% line rate uh, for the larger frame sizes. Okay, so this is test number two. Uh, again, let me explain. This is uh, running the consistency tests where we run 10 trials uh, to make sure that we get a consistent performance of the, the packets running uh, through these different topologies. So again, uh, uh, let me explain the chart to you a little bit. So for the 64 uh, byte frame size, uh, which is running, uh, the, the um, is showing you roughly about, I don't know, 30, uh, 30, again, this is percentage of line rate on the y-axis. Y so it's consistently, the dot on the 64 byte says that there is zero variance uh, after running 10 trials, and it consistently, consistently runs at about 30% of line rate. For the other uh, 128 byte and the 256 byte, you see the, the line uh, that goes across the, the diamond there so that is, shows you the variance, okay? And in the next chart, I'll show you the variance there. So, but it consistently, for the 128 byte, consistently running at 55% of line rate and for 256 byte frame sizes, about 97, 98% uh, with a slight variation on the, the consistency test. So if I, take you into to this next chart. So here you will see, uh, for example, on the 256 byte, you will see some of the runs don't hit the, the 100%. And you can see that, that is the variation that, that I'm talking about, which you saw on the, on the previous slide uh, with, the, with the bar there. So that was the variation that <coughs> showed up uh, in our test for the different runs uh, for all of the, the, the packet sizes, frame sizes. So again, this is showing you consistency after running 10 trials, uh, showing you, the, you know, the, the line rate percentage uh, for the different frame sizes. This is single VM, the, the, the test that we did. The consistency test is for the single VM uh, topology. Okay. This is uh, test number three. Um, Again, uh, this shows you the latency test. So what you see, again, on the x-axis is uh, the frame sizes. And what you see on the y-axis is the microseconds, latency in microseconds. And so, um, again, running these tests for different frame sizes, um, you see a chart for minimum latency, which is roughly in the 15 microseconds. Uh, uh, which is the minimum, the average, uh, roughly about 20 to 18, uh, somewhere in that range. Uh, and then maximum latency uh, on some of the runs were um, in the 220, 240 micro, microseconds. Okay. So this shows you the latency distribution of um, you know, when you run uh, these tests for a few trial runs. So the next chart will show you sort of the, the breakdown as well. So we, we broke, the, broke this down into different buckets, so less than 50 microseconds, 50 to 75, 75 to 100. And so you can see um, as the, 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 um, the percentage completely decreases as uh, the latency you know, buckets go, go to your right. So there is latency, um, you know, less than 50 microseconds, you can see the, for the 64 byte, um, uh, frame size, for example, 99.42 times uh, percent um, times uh, it's it's consistent with line rate uh, uh, or uh, with the latency, but there's a, a point 18 percent which is in the bucket 150 to 200 microseconds. You can see there's some uh, latency which shows you the the max latency that is uh, that was seen through some of these tests. So again. Um, uh, these buckets show you where the latency, uh, which, how many microseconds um, latency we, we found running these tests uh, multiple times. Uh, 
Okay, this is the fourth and uh, final test that we ran. Um, again, for uh, layer two, uh, we switched performance uh, based on the RFC 2554. This is a standard test uh, you know, run by uh, most um, uh, L2 uh, switches uh, for, for scale, uh, including performance, benchmarking, flow test. And this shows uh, where we ran uh, 20 flows through the switch, 2,000, and then 20,000 flows. Uh, and you can see, uh, again, um, that is the, the line rate percentage. So no matter um, when it scales from 20 flows to 20,000 flows, you still get line rate performance uh, on, on the vSwitch. So this was uh, the test run last week. Like I said, uh, we will continue to add additional tests um, to what we, we saw um, previously, and we will uh, output a, an official report uh, based on these tests as well. Okay. Uh, with that, I think uh, just want to summarize. Uh, I don't know if Glenn, yep. you want to say a few words. So, uh, like I mentioned, uh, it was run by a third party, uh, Tolly Group and Spirant uh, actually conducted the test. We will have the test um, results soon. Yep. Um, and uh, some of the next phases of the tests are based on resiliency. So, whether a, a VM goes down or a host goes down. How quickly can we do live migration, the rapid um, detection of failure? Yep. So those are some of the tests that we'll be running uh, next week. Uh, yep. And those results also we, we, we will share with, uh, with the community. Yep. Unfortunately, as, as Madhu mentioned, uh, we had a little uh, mother nature intervened in our best laid plans to be able to prevent the, uh, present the resiliency tests. But it'll be available on the uh, HPE website as well as the Wind River website uh, to be able to get the full disclosure document. Uh, we're working to put this together now. In the meantime, we encourage you to come visit the HPE booth, uh, take a look at the demo, uh, multiple demos, and uh, you'll be able to uh, see some of the performance and, uh, and how the helium carrier grade product is working. If you have any questions, please uh, use the mic. Uh, so we can record it. Go ahead. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. Pretty much every hardware vendor, Dell, HP, is presenting their test results. Whenever I go as a solution architect for designing and putting a bill of material together, what I do go look at the spec.org to see the independent people verifying the hardware by means of CPU, vCPU, you know, ratios, and so on, the virtualization side effects. And then I'm stuck at there, because after that there's no more KPIs to look at it. When, you, when I look at your presentation, yes, you're using Wind River DPDK enabled OVS, most likely or not, using Mellanox Nix to offload the traffic to the, those guys with SRIOV, which improves the performance, yes. But when I look at the, what HP or Dell does in the sense of adding value to this hardware, I see pretty much nothing. So one of the things that we're, no, uh, so uh, yeah, we, we are producing the hardware, but one of the things we're looking at, uh, I mean, looking to do with the Helion carrier grade is to take advantage of that hardware. So how we can do CPU pinning and process pinning, thread pinning, to take advantage of, of that hardware. So that is some things in the work. So where the software can take advantage of some of the, the, the hardware capabilities. I'm glad you mentioned about the CPU pinning and uh, thread pinning, because. We have been testing stuff as well. When you look at the CPU pinning, the NUMA architecture and so on, the limiting factor is the layer three cache versus the QPI bridge between the sockets. Is it gonna really affect the NFV VMs or not? Or shall we just skip totally the pinning so it's gonna be much easier for VM to recover or m migrate to another host? Do you, if you have any test results regarding this, using CPU pinning, thread pinning, NUMA architecture, that would be awesome. Thank okay. you. Okay. okay. Thank for you for sure. the input, by the way. That's, right. that's uh, interesting. And of course, one of the things that we're trying to do is be able to demonstrate um, an industry standard uh, benchmark, which ha you know, not all hardware is created equal, as you've, as you've mentioned. So you want to be able to provide something that can be run on a wider range of hardware. Uh, we didn't use Mellanox. We used Intel, we used Intel Niantex. Right. Um, and uh, going straight up to the uh, to the V switch, there was no SRIOV involved. Correct. Um, happy to disclose more details on that. Absolutely. 
the question over there? Yeah, you've, you've mentioned a couple times about, you know, industry standard benchmarking, but the only results I saw were your results, and you, you claimed orders of magnitude improvement, but you didn't demonstrate that to us. You showed us your results, which are great. I'm not okay. I'm dis you know, disclaiming that, but what were the, what were the results of straight open, you know, open source? Research? Okay. Um, so great question. That was, and you're right, that wasn't part of this actual benchmark. Um, so what we did uh, in, a, in a previous test in that comparison that I showed you where I showed 17 cores running versus the one core, that was a, a, a separate, that was a different test that we ran. It was running um, a, a commercial version of, of uh, Open vSwitch. Um, we weren't using, uh, you know, we weren't using the latest, greatest bleeding edge because we wanted to show our uh, Wind River commercial product versus other commercial products. So uh, in that model, I want to say that it was running about um, three to four uh, megabytes per, um, three, uh, was it? three to four million megabytes per second, something like that, um, compared to our uh, vSwitch, which was running about 20 uh, megabits, megabytes per second. Um, significant, it was about 10x uh, altogether. Um, so I, I, guess, I guess that's my concern, is, yeah. is you throw up your results, but you don't throw up what you compare it against, and you say it's a 17 to one, so would I, would I expect at a 256 byte packet that I'm running at 5% of line rate? Is that what you're claiming? What those no, we were actually running at about 60%. Mm -hmm. uh, we were running at about 60% align rate. Oh, oh no, I'm sorry, that was with 64-bit packets. Right. That was with 64. You run 100%. Uh, yeah, so we were running 100%. Are you, are you right. saying that, that at OVS they're going to run at 5% align rate? Is that, is that the claim? Um, Ish? You know. Ish. Ish. I, um, yeah, so, so again, what we were showing was just ours. We didn't uh, want to show... Uh, you know, another competitor's product in this particular session. Um, so we were just showing what ours are, are uh, but you make measuring claims at. against the competitor's product. That's what I don't understand is, is you're going to make a claim, which is cool, you know. We're making a claim of what our product or performs do, at. But you, you said I have orders of magnitude better. So you've made a claim against your, pro against your competitor, which is, all fine, which is fine. Yep. That's what, you know, sort of about. But at least show that to us so we can understand okay. what mm -hmm. it really looks mm -hmm. like. Yeah. No, that's, that's good feedback. I appreciate that. Any other questions? This is great, by the way. I appreciate it. So I think I have one that might be a, a follow-on to that. Okay. With regard to packet forwarding performance, uh, it looks like you ran tests at the various interesting packet sizes, 64, 128, 256. Um, did you run any tests with typical traffic and understand what the average packet size was so that we can understand what performance would be in a nominal case of actually using the infrastructure rather than a controlled test? Okay. This was a more uh, a controlled sort of, uh, you know, with the, the Spire and just sending out, you know, so it was not a, um, a typical test where you're just running arbitrary, you know, packets uh, or traffic through the, okay. uh, through the vSwitch. But right. that is one of the tests that we will, we will uh, okay, I mean, conduct. Have, have you tried that at all, just to see what, you know, just in a normal I am not setting? aware of it, but I, I will find out. I'm okay. not sure. Uh, that, that's really interesting, right? Because yeah. although yeah. it might perform at 100% of the line rate at 64, but, excuse me, 256 mm -hmm. byte packets, if your average packet size is smaller than that, you're going to drop packets, and you have no idea which packets you dropped. Right. And then that's a bad right. deal, right? Right, right. Okay. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Definitely appreciate all of you uh, spending some time here to come listen to about the, uh, the HPE solution. And again, I encourage you to uh, go down and, and see the demonstration at the HPE booth. And please do look in the next week or two uh, for a, a much more detailed published report of these benchmarks and also some of the resiliency and availability benchmarks. And hopefully it'll help uh, clarify some of the questions that some of you may have had as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.